the church, if you would open to Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah 5, starting in verse 20. This is God's Word. Through the prophet Isaiah, God says, Woe to those who call evil good, and good evil, who put darkness for light, and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes, and shrewd in their own sight. Father, my prayer is simple. Lord, we pray that we would not violate this text. We pray that none of us in this room would ever be those who call what is darkness light and what is light darkness. Lord, help us to call and believe what You call light light and what You call darkness darkness. Lord, we pray that in all of our hearts it would be solidified tonight that You get to be the one who determines right and wrong. Not us. And so Lord, we respectfully and humbly ask You to put us in our place and to do it with gentleness as You often and always do. Pray You do it through Your Word. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we continue uh, this series on the modern self. Uh, we're a few weeks into it, and let me just remind you uh, to kind of catch some of you back up or just remind us where we've been. We've been talking about what we've been calling the modern self, or really the psychologized uh, self is what we've been looking at for these last four weeks. Um, I started this off in Romans 1, and we began to unpack that in Romans 1, and then Kent took us into the second week, uh, what, what's called the conscience, that God has given a moral system He's written His law on every heart, and that, uh, that people suppress that, and, and that people can begin to uh, ruin and, and cause to malfunction this compass that God has put in them, this moral compass. And then I came after that the next week and talked about cultural fragility, that uh, it is a very fragile person and a very fragile culture uh, who suppresses the truth of God does not want to hear from God, does not want to uh, live for God or submit to God, but wants to be their own God and determine their own truth. And they're unwilling to hear God's truth or live by God's truth. I said that's a fragile person and a fragile culture. And a fragile culture and a fragile person, all they have to work with, since they're not working with God's truth or, or reality, they only have emotion. And so they must weaponize emotion in the form of anger, and in the form of hurt. And then we came in last week, Kent did, and and basically argued from Genesis 3 that the serpent in the garden was the first postmodernist. And that he began to deconstruct the truth, as many in our culture are doing, uh, be cynical toward the truth, and question the truth And that pattern has continued into our culture, into many, many people that don't even realize that's what they're doing. And so this is the psychologized self. We've spent four weeks on that, and now basically what we're going to do, we're going to pivot, and we're going to take this psychologized self that we've been unpacking, and we're going to begin to apply it to two areas, sexuality and politics. And what we need to understand is that every self is being conformed to something. Um, There is no, you're not stagnant. You're not stationary. You aren't, you're moldable. You're shapeable. Every person is. And so either uh, the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, is conforming us into the image of Christ, or our culture is conforming us to the image of the modern self, which is a psychologized, sexualized, politicized self. That's, we're all being formed into 
something. And, and, and it's true. It would, be, it would be worth saying that 100 years ago, this was not happening, not in the same way. All right, People were being dehumanized in other ways, but it was different 100 years ago than what the agenda, the cultural agenda is now and in the, in the, in the way that they're trying to form us into this modern self. And so um, we need to remember that there is an agenda uh, that is first to psychologize us, and once uh, we have been psychologized, meaning we have rejected ultimate truth and we now determine truth for ourselves, once we're psychologized, uh, now we can be sexualized. And once we're that, that psychologized, sexualized self, we, we now need politics to put some weight and force behind all of this. And that's what's happening. Uh, this indoctrination is what I'll, I'll argue for, that it is an indoctrination um, happening, and it is happening um, to countless billions of people, and they don't know it. They don't realize that this is what's going on. And I'm just zealous uh, pastorally to try to guard us and help us be aware um, of what is happening in the world. Uh, y'all remember we started off the series in 2 Corinthians 10.4. Uh, where Paul says, we destroy arguments. Christians, we, the church, destroy arguments in every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So we're not just studying what the Bible says on these topics just to merely understand them or analyze them. We're studying what the Bible says on these topics so that we can destroy the ideologies that are arrogant because they've raised themselves against the knowledge of God and they ultimately destroy people who are made in His image. And so we're not apathetic about this. We, it's not like we don't care. We do care. And, and, and we have an aggressive, intentional agenda. You know, we, I think we've all realized at this point that the school system isn't going to do this for us. The government isn't going to do this for us. All right? the destroying of ideologies and belief systems that war against the truth of God is the church's job. He, he's given that responsibility to the church to put down wrong ideas and to exalt right and true ideas. That's on us. And so we need to understand uh, what is happening in the world. And, and, and I'll say just lastly, and I said this last week, I'll, I'll say this to us every week, there is a posture and an attitude in which we do this. And the Bible says it's with patience. It's with gentleness. It's with humility. Because we want the culture to see something of God's character in us. Even as we oppose things that they believe. We're not enemies of the culture, in other words. We're servants of Christ. And, and so the attitude in which we take our stand greatly matters. Um, I want to just share how I prepared for this particular sermon. As you can see on the, on the screen, this is a little bit of a different type of sermon than we would normally do. Um, so I prepared by listening to four voices. Uh, the first voice you can't ever, all of us listen to all the time, you can't ignore this voice. It's the culture's voice. All right, they're yelling this at us constantly, their message and, and on this topic. So I heard them without even trying. I hear this voice, and that was part of my preparation for this sermon. I intentionally went to God's Word and, and wanted to hear God's voice, because it's the authoritative voice. It's the voice that is... Uh, actually, Christians have agreed what God has said on these issues of uh, sexual ethics and morality throughout 2,000 years of church history. This isn't, a really, this isn't a debatable topic until about the last century when liberal scholars came in and began to do some things that we'll talk about. Nobody questioned the, the, the sexual morality of Scripture. Everyone has agreed on this. Uh, it is not confusing what God has said. He has not been vague. And then I also, many Christians would just stop there. Okay, the culture's saying this, God's Word says this, bam, I'm ready to get up and preach. I listened to two other voices additionally. One of those is the progressive, this is what they would call themselves, progressive Christians. And I listened to the arguments that they made. And, and here's when I started listening to them. 17 years ago, 
in the university, the public university, I began to be introduced to higher criticism, textual criticism. What is what you say? What is textual criticism? It's people that love to criticize the text, and they're experts and they have PhDs just criticizing the Bible. And and so I began to listen to that in in my undergraduate studies and hearing these arguments that have been going on for some time now, and. Um, and then I listened to lastly, and this is really good for my soul, uh, I listened to the testimonies of those who have been saved out of the LGBTQ plus community. And that's really powerful because that's ultimately what we're aiming at and what we ultimately want is to see the gospel power liberate people from what they are in bondage to. And, um, and it was just powerful listening to some testimonies of those who the Lord had shown mercy to and changed. And, um, and so let me just say pastorally to us, uh, you need to settle these things in your mind now. You, you do not want to study these things out to, to figure out what you believe about these things uh, when you get outside of this gathering. Okay, uh, that's part of what the corporate gathering is, actually. Why, part of why we gather together is to solidify our moral convictions on what the Bible teaches. That is at least part of what we're doing when we gather every week. What has God said about human sexuality? Part of what we're doing here is to go, we need to dig down some, some strong beliefs on, on these issues together, not separately or alone. Because here's... You know, scrolling through your, your, your phone, you know, at 10 o'clock at night by yourself is not a good time to figure out what you believe about human sexuality. It's not a good time to figure out what you believe when you're talking to your friend who's telling you they have same sex desires. And now you're emotionally wanting to be, I mean, you're their friend. But you're trying to figure out what you believe on that. That's not a good time to figure that out. It's not a good time to figure it out when your child is sitting at the kitchen table with you or your grandchild and saying, I'm gay. And if you don't accept it, you don't love me. And you're going, whoa, it's a lot at stake here. But you haven't really thought it through before. I have to bring this up because there's a lot of Christians who aren't studying this thing on the front end, and then they come to the back end or these, a, a relational situation or a, a moment of temptation, and they're not ready. And there's going to be millions of Christians who cave on these issues because uh, they are not ready to deal with, I am this way, I have this sexual orientation, and if you don't accept it, you don't love me. They're not ready for that. They're not ready to be called bigoted or homophobic or unloving, or hateful. And so when that accusation comes, they pull back away from the Scripture, and they compromise. And so I'm just saying we need to nail this down, what we believe about this, and, and, and really determine what does God really say, and who is really the authority here? Do I get to determine what I believe about what's going on in the culture, or does God have a say, and as he's spoken into these things. So my title tonight is The Modern Self and the LGBTQ Plus Movement. Um, part one, we'll, we'll come back at this next week, and uh, tonight we're going to focus more on the, the issue of homosexuality. Next week, transgenderism. Uh, those are two massive, unless you just aren't watching what's happening in the world, these things are coming like a tidal wave, one first and then the other behind it. And it's in this acronym, if you look, LGBTQ+, some of you are like, you added a Q and a plus since the last time you talked. Didn't you just say LGBT last time? And I did. So why did I add a Q and a plus? Um, let me back up and say, it is, what, what is the date today? February 13th, 2022? Um, Right now, that's not, that's not the actual acronym. It's much longer than that. Uh, 
I wrote that down because it's just, you know, it's a, a simpler way to try to get at the idea. But you look on some of these progressive uh, LGBTQ plus websites, and it says intentionally, it, I read one website that said, don't memorize the acronym because it's fluid and it's ever changing. So it's you're like, I can't remember all those letters. Well, it doesn't matter because it'll be different in a year. And I, and I don't say that mockingly. I say that seriously. It will be different in a year. If you go back two years ago, it didn't have these letters. So here's the real title. LGBTQIA2S+. That's, that's I think, the most updated uh, acronym. It's got numbers in it, it's got letters in it, it has a plus symbol in it, okay? And, and you go, is that going to grow? Yes. By design, it has the plus because they're going to add more. And you say, well, what do those even mean? Well, lesbian, L, G, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or questioning. So they have, word, when a word uh, has another, they both start with a Q, they just lop them on top of each other. So queer and questioning is the Q. Intersex, asexual, or allies are both A's, but those are different concepts we'll come to next week. Two-spirit plus. And, and you can expect the conversation to move to animals, to robots, and to children next. It will not stop because that's how it's designed to work. And so, when we come to LGB, uh, we're talking about homosexuality. That's lesbian, gay, and bi. That's homosexuality. That's an attack on the Bible's definition of marriage. When we, when we hear about homosexuality, it's an attack on marriage. When we hear the T, now that's a different category. That's not about, we're not dealing with homosexuality anymore. T is transgenderism, and that has to do with God's design regarding gender. And who, who are we as people? Who is the self? This is a metaphysical question. This is an anthropomorph, uh, anthropomorphism. This is about the, uh, the metaphysics of being. Who are we? Transgenderism is an attack on the self, on who God made us to be. And so that's why we're coming back next week, because we have to come at it from a different angle but let me say this about transgenderism. Ryan Anderson, um, he's a, a research fellow at Heritage Foundation. He speaks at Princeton and other places. He's well-respected in this field, but he says this, the transgender discussion is getting into anthropo uh, anthropological kind of metaphysical questions. And what's interesting is that the activists on the left want to present these things as if they were merely scientific and medical because in our culture, listen, the high priests are not the philosophers or the theologians. Why? Well, because we've gotten rid of truth. Those are not the high priests in our culture. They've been, historically, theologians have been because we believed in truth. Now he says, the high priests in our culture are the doctors, the scientists, and more specifically, the psychotherapists, the psychiatrists, and the psychologists. They are the new high priests. And I would qualify that a little bit because that's not entirely true, and I think this author would agree with me, um, only the psychiatrists, the scientists, and the doctors that affirm the LGBT agenda. The other ones who oppose it are not high priests and, and, and cannot speak into these matters. And, and what this reveals is that this is a religious system. We are dealing with a religious system. Wikipedia, let me... Just give us a general definition of, uh, of religion that's kind of being used today. Religion is usually defined as a social cultural system designed uh, de with designated behaviors, practices, and moral beliefs, worldviews, texts, sanctified places, prophecies, ethics, and organizations that gener generally relate humanity to the supernatural. So if you all think back to the first week, I identified some prophets. Remember Darwin, Nietzsche, Freud, Marx? Those are prophets. They speak on behalf of this religion. And then 
now I'm saying there's priests, there's scientists, psycho- psychiatrists, psychologists, and they are priests and have authority if they affirm the right agenda. And then this religion has sacred books, there's inspired authors, there's holy organizations, there's systems of morality. I won't unpack all those right now, but they exist in this particular religion. And they evangelize, and they make converts, and they do it better than the church at this point. And you say, well, doesn't a religion have to worship a god? Well, yes, they do. And this religion is a polytheistic religion because every person is their own god and determines their own truth and their own system of morality. This is a religion that we're talking about. And I know some of you may be thinking, Pastor, you, you sound very alarmist. <laughs> like, don't you see that there's churches all over the place and we're, you know... I see the church buildings. I see cars in the parking lot. My concern is with the people in those buildings and what view of sexual ethics they actually have at this point. I don't think even in the most conservative places there would be a conservative sexual ethic like we would expect. I think think we'd be greatly concerned if we sat down and actually heard what many people believe on these matters. Uh, Statistically, Pew Research uh, uh, questioned 35,000 adults they surveyed in 2007, and they found that 50% of Americans said homosexuality is perfectly fine. So 50% in 2007. In 2014, that number was up to 62%. Now, 2014 to the present, how much has that changed in eight years? I didn't research that and take the time to do it. You can do that later if you want. I would estimate that that's got to be up in the 80s percent at this point who would say, no problem with homosexuality. Now, we're talking adults. If you go to a high school, if you go to a university campus, this is a worthless study because virtually everyone would say there is no issue with homosexuality, morally. Uh, it, it, this, is, this has become pervasive. I, I quoted a few weeks ago the New Yorker magazine, um, which said 30% of females, 25 and under, identified as LGBT. That's almost one in three females under 25 who prefer women to men. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. That's just what the survey and the the article in the New Yorker said. But that's shocking. Um, There's a book. uh, I almost hate to quote this. I I like to give a source if I have one, so you don't think I just came up with this, but the the title is terrible uh, of this particular book. It sounds like a sci-fi book. Uh, But it's called The The Gay Invasion. Um, It's not a good book. I wouldn't recommend it, but uh, it was written back in the 70s, and it makes a few legitimate points because this author is basically trying to show how homosexuality has made this massive movement in America and begin to pervade everything, and it talks about at the government levels, uh, how many uh, in in the homosexual uh, community have have got into the government, but then it goes back to Scripture, and it says, uh, he goes back to Isaiah, uh, where sodomy was all around, a part of life, it was part of life in Assyria, in Babylon, and in Egypt. There were numerous pharaohs that were homosexual. And then he goes back and he argues that it systematically killed every culture. Sodom first, then later Judah, and then it destroyed Greece and later Rome. Now you could argue there was other things that contributed to the downfall of those cultures, but homosexuality was among them. We could argue this, and I'll say something about this at the end. This is a little bit common sense, right? <laughs> I don't want to get into the biology of this, but if you, aren't, if you aren't having babies, you can't have a culture that survives. So some of that is a little bit self-explanatory that it would destroy a culture if enough people are homosexual and not procreating. But he argues that it destroys at a personal level and at a spiritual level. And, and guys, look, I know some of y'all are thinking, 
probably, um, we, we have known that homosexuality is something that, that we've dealt with historically. There's nothing new under the sun. Why, why are we talking about this like this now? And I would say, if you go to many historians who have studied history on this issue, they will say that there are two things that are very different happening right now on this issue. One of them is the issue of transgenderism. That is a unique thing happening in our day, especially when you bring in science and the medical field and how that's relating. The other thing would be the aggression in which this movement is pushing forward in the culture. I, I, I think it would be fair to call it, uh, I, I'm being, maybe not, Maybe it's not the best thing to say it's an agenda or it's a movement, but to say it's a religious crusade because it's, it's pushing forward with the force of a religion, with the backing of a government. Eric Erickson said, you might not be interested in the culture war, but the culture war is interested in you. And you will be made to care. And so the question for everyone in, in this room is which system of morality is going to hold authority? Because there's two systems of morality. There's two sexual ethics. There's the Bibles and then there's the cultures. And they're not the same. And they're saying the opposite. It's not like the Bible has a sexual ethic and the world doesn't. They both do. Which one wins? The question, as we look at the Bible's sexual ethic, is not, I don't really know how to interpret that. That could be taken so many ways. Is that really what he's saying? It's kind of vague. When you study what the Scripture says on these matters, nobody says that stuff. It is utterly clear. This is not a vague topic. And when a prophet, like Moses or like Paul, or, or, or like so many, Isaiah, when they say, thus says the Lord, we're not dealing with Moses' opinion. We're not dealing with Paul's opinion. We're not dealing with Isaiah's opinion. We're, we have to reckon with, is this God speaking or not? Is God speaking third person through a person who says, thus says the Lord, and the voice of God is behind that? That's what we have to figure out. 1 Thessalonians 2.13, when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but what it really is. The word of God. And so guys, what, what's happening in our culture is you have progressives over here, uh, conservatives over here, and they're both yelling, this is right, no, this is right, this is what I believe, no, this is what I believe. Conservative view, a liberal view. And you know what? Unless, they, unless they're standing on this, it's just one person's opinion versus the other. And one's a little more conservative and one's a little more liberal, but they're just people's opinions. And we're going to get in the midst of all of that unless we have this as an authoritative word over all of that back and forth. It, it is essential that we study out this issue. And I, I, I don't want to let anybody down here, but I'm not going to do an exhaustive treatment of the Bible on this issue of homosexuality tonight. We could. We'd be here a long, long time. Um, the goal tonight was to say, how is this culture seeking to indoctrinate us in their sexual ethic, especially as it relates to homosexuality? That's, that's all I'm trying to do. And I want to put five... Five cultural, we'll call them cultural objections to the Bible's teaching on homosexuality. So I've, as I've listened and as I've tried to understand what opposition there is to the Bible's teaching on this topic, there's five uh, objections that I hear the culture giving more than anything else. And so we'll just answer these. The first objection is this. Stop judging us not an objection, not really an argument, it's more of a, a command and a statement, but I think it's the first thing that has to be said. I, I was listening to a, a really popular uh, Christian apologist a few years ago, and he was talking about doing evangelism uh, on, 
mainly among youth and um, younger people. And he was saying that the, he used to do this back in you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. And people had questions like, did Jesus really raise from the dead? You know, how do we know the Bible is the word of God? Um, you know, is, is there a real, literal heaven and hell? Like, that's the kind of questions he was answering. And he said, now nobody asks any questions like this. Nobody cares about those type of questions. All the questions are about sexuality and politics. So all, all of the, the, the ones that are on the front line trying to get the gospel into American culture are coming face to face with these questions. And look, the question is not, is Christianity true? That's not what people are asking. What they're asking is, why are Christians so bigoted? Because of our views on these issues. That's where we're at. And, the, and, and a verse is very popular that will be, if this hasn't been quoted to you, it probably will. And it's a great verse. We love it. Uh, but it's Matthew 7, judge not that lest you be judged. And the, and the culture will say that to you if you talk about what God says on this. And so it's worth saying, what, what, what does Jesus actually mean by judge not? Because what our culture means by that is you have no right to tell me what to do with my body. Or you're judging me. That's what the culture means by that. But is that what Jesus means? It would be worth remembering that in John 7, 7, Jesus said, the world hates me because I testify against it that its works are evil. So is Jesus judging the world when He goes to people and says, those works are evil that you're doing with your body? Is Jesus violating the command to not judge people? Is He judging people? No. The culture doesn't understand what Jesus means by judgment. That's the problem. They've redefined judgment. We know in Ephesians 5, in the context of sexual sin, God commands Christians to rebuke and expose the works of darkness. To a very sexualized church in Corinth, he says, destroy lofty opinions that raise themselves against the knowledge of God. And I would say, especially in our day, that's the LGBT arguments. And he tells us to destroy those opinions. John the Baptist, you all know Jesus called him the greatest man to ever live, but what did he get killed for? Why did he get his head chopped off? Because he spoke out about the sexual immorality of Herod. Is all that sinful judgment? No. Why? Because those living in sexual sin have already been judged. We don't judge the culture because the culture has already been judged. That's what Jesus said in John 3.19. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their works were evil. So we don't judge the culture or the world because they have a judge. And it's not you and it's not me. And so if someone quotes to you, judge not, lest you be judged, go, I, I'm not judging you. Because you have a judge. And it's, it's certainly not me. And I don't want to play that role for you. Now, let me, let me say another thing on this being judgmental uh, issue, because this is a, a really significant issue to deal with. Um, I don't blame. I want to give credit to the LGBT community or this, uh, this pushback. I want to say there's some legitimacy in it. Um, because I believe that the church, by and large, has massively neglected 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And so, I think the culture is looking at the church and going, you haven't dealt with hypocrisy and sexual sin in your own churches, so what are you talking about? Why should we listen to you? They see the hypocrisy. I was listening to a panel discussion um, not long ago with it had a few black Christian leaders, and they were talking about the problems in the black church. And one of them said this, we're too hypocritical to reach the younger generation because we'll shout from the pulpits about homosexuality, but then he said, in our own churches we're singing, many of our hymns are written by homosexuals. <laughs> I paused it and what? 
is that, and everybody else on the panel was like, yeah, that's true, you know. Like it was common knowledge that homosexuals were writing half the hymns in the black church. I've never heard such a thing. Now, I'm, I don't know this. I just heard the panel discussion. But if that's true, if it's true, if, okay, I don't know, if it's true, that would, that would be a significant reason why the homosexual community may not want to hear from those churches. And that isn't just, that has nothing to do with the black church. That's any church that won't deal with sexual sin in their midst. Now, let me just remind us what Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. He says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not meaning at all the sexually immoral of this world. Greedy, swindlers, idolaters, since you need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he's guilty of sexual, sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater or reveler or drunk or a swindler. Not even to eat with such a one. For what have we to do with judging outsiders? He goes, it's not our job to judge outsiders. Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. You hear that? If the church isn't first judging those inside the church and dealing with the sexual sin in our congregations... Who are we to, to say anything to the culture on these things? Good reason why people would call that out. So if somebody quotes to me, or quotes to you, uh, judge not lest you be judged, and, and we're talking about sexual issues, and they are a professing Christian, I would say, I am commanded to judge you. If, if we're talking about sexual issues, and someone quotes that and says, don't judge me, and they're not a Christian, they don't profess Christ, then our answer is, I'm not judging you. I'm commanded not to judge you. God judges you, not me. Now, here's the second objection. But Jesus never spoke about homosexuality. This is obviously a very popular objection. And to be fair to those who, who object in this way, if we're meaning, thus says, the, you know, if, if we want Jesus to have said, uh, homosexuality is sin. All right, true. He did not say that exactly like that, but he did say it four other ways. Here's the first: He appointed apostles who, by the Spirit, spoke on homosexuality. First Corinthians six, First Timothy one. Men who practice homosexuality will not inherit the kingdom of God. It says in First Corinthians six, and Jesus appointed those apostles to speak on God's behalf. They're His representatives. Secondly, He repeated positive statements about God's original design for marriage and sexuality. Matthew 19 would be an example that God's design is for man and woman in marriage, and so anything outside that context is wrong. Third, He used the word porneia, which was understood by His audience to involve all sorts of sexual sins, including homosexuality and many other sins. And that word in that Jewish context was connected to the law and the Jewish moral system which was built by the law, which leads to the fourth point. He didn't have to name every specific sexual sin because the law already did. And Jesus affirmed the Old Testament law. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Jesus affirmed that. He never changed that when it comes to the issue of homosexuality. So Leviticus 18.22, when it says, you shall not lie with a man as one lies with a female, it's an abomination. Jesus didn't change that. Le Leviticus 20.13, if, if a man who lies with a male as one lies with a woman, both of them have committed a detestable act Jesus didn't go, oh, I've got a new interpretation on that. That Old Testament passage. He affirmed it. He agreed with it. The morality of that stands. Now many in the liberal churches are going to push back and say, okay, we agree with all that, but here's the, here's the little qualifier. There would be the third objection. 
What's condemned is promiscuous homosexuality, not loving, committed, same-sex relationships. Okay, That's the distinction that you're going to hear. We're talking, yes, we all agree that certain types of homosexuality are bad, but if people really love each other, if they're really committed, if they want to uh, really love and have a relationship, then that's not what the Bible is talking about. First of all, that's an argument of, 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 from silence. The Bible never says such a thing. But I'm not just saying that from a Christian perspective. Uh, I'll quote a few from outside the Christian community. So we have ancient texts on homosexuality available. Really, really old ones that would have talked about the culture in the time the Bible was written. It's not fun reading. Okay, I'm not saying this is a great way to spend your time, but if you wanted to search this out, there's a book that's 558 pages um, called Homosexuality in Greece and Rome, a source book for basic documents. It's edited by a non-Christian scholar and historian. What's shocking is he says in Rome and in Greece, uh, homosexuality wasn't just promiscuous type of uh, prostitution type stuff, but you also have people committed to each other in lifelong relationships. In Rome, in Greece, in these places that the Bible was written and speaking to. N.T. Wright, who we disagree with on some significant issues, he gets this right when he says, when I read the account of the early Roman Empire of the, it, regarding the practice of homosexuality, a point which is often missed, they knew a great deal about what people today would regard as long-term, reasonably stable relationships between two people of the same gender. This is not a modern invention. It was already there in Plato. They knew about the whole range of options there. That throws a wrench in the progressive Christian arguments that build their argument off of this point. Here's Lewis Crompton, who is a gay man. He's a pioneer of queer studies. He said in a massive book called Homosexuality and Civilization, he said, some interpreters seeking to mitigate Paul's harshness have read Romans 1 as condemning not homosexuality in general, but only those experimenting with it. So not people who are born homosexual, but just people who are doing it. And he goes, according to this interpretation, Paul's words were not directed at homosexuals in committed relationships. However well-intentioned it seems, it's unhistorical. Nowhere does Paul or any other Jewish writer of this period imply the least acceptance of same-sex relationships under any circumstances. The idea that homosexuals might be redeemed by mutual devotion would have been wholly foreign to Paul or any Jew or the early Christian. Now that's, again, people outside the Christian community saying this. If there were ever a chance for Paul to look at a church and go, guys, you know what? The issue is not homosexuality. The issue is love. And if two people of the same sex want to love each other, it's okay. If there was ever a place for him to say that, it would be in the church in Corinth. Because no question, there were people who were saved in that church who came out of or participated in homosexual acts. And they have been saved. And he does not say, oh, it's fine, just marry to Christ and continue in this or something. He says, such were some of you. You are no longer. You've been saved. You've been changed. You are no longer who you used to be. The fourth objection is, if, a, if I was born this way, how could this be sinful? Scientific America is a, a secular magazine. Um, They've done numerous studies on this, and I'll just cut to the quote that I want to give, but this is out of the magazine, quote, genetic score cannot in any way be used to predict same-sex sexual behavior of an individual. So it's not genetic, they're saying. Many, after reading this conclusion, said, this is the end of the gay gene. Some in the LGBT community were honest enough to admit there is, quote, no biological basis for the homosexual orientation. 
Okay, again, not a Christian source there. Very, very secular magazine basing that off of a bunch of studies that were done. Now, um, if somebody says to me personally, I feel like I've felt these things since I was very young, since childhood, I'm not going to disagree with them. If they've felt certain things since they were a child. I've had sinful tendencies since I was a child in numerous areas. All of us have. We all know what it's like to feel temptation towards sin from a young age. Scripture says we were born with a sinful nature, which means our desires, affections, and sexuality is often disordered, dysfunctional, and sinful even from a young age. So when someone tries to excuse their sin by saying, I was born this way, a Christian response is, therefore, Jesus said you need to be born again. And I need to be born again. And that's the whole point. You were born wrong. Something was wrong when you were born. That's the whole point. It isn't that you just were condemned in your sin once you became 13 and started doing more bad things. What does David say in Psalms 51? I was brought forth in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. That's the problem for all of us. So if somebody tries to use that as an excuse that they're not in sin because they were born that way, it doesn't hold for any of us. It doesn't take us off the hook. It's still considered a sin. Now here would be a legitimate uh, comeback to that that someone may say, well, why would God make me that way? And what I would say is God didn't make you that way. Your parents did. Your parents made you that way. You inherited their sinful nature as I inherited mine, and as I passed on my sinful nature to my own children. Romans 1, we could unpack this more next week. It deals explicitly with this when it says women exchange natural relations, key phrase, natural relations, for those that are contrary to nature. You hear that? And men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. So, these things are contrary to nature. They are not how God originally intended any of this to be. It's, it's backwards, it's unnatural. And many in the LGBT community feel very trapped very, very trapped. Um, this is who I am. Some are proud of that. Others feel trapped and want out. And I think that this LGBTQ plus religion has done something very deceptive to enslave many people further. They have turned homosexuality from a behavior into an identity. And that's not accidental. Listen to Mark Stein. He says, language has been an important weapon in the gay movement very, a, a very, with a very swift advance. He says, in the old days, there was sodomy, a technical biblical term. It was an act, an action. In the 19th century, the word homosexual was coined a condition, right? a disease, something is wrong with this person. That was the 19th century. A generation ago, the accepted term became gay, an identity. He says each formulation raises the stakes. One can object to and even criminalize an act. One can uh, be obligated to be sympathetic toward a condition, but once it is a full-fledged 24-7 identity, like being Hispanic or Asian, Anything less than wholehearted acceptance gets you marked down as a bigot. And there's where we are. That's what's happened. And this leads us to the fifth and final and really quick. Fifth objection. How can a loving God condemn homosexuality? And again, this could be like a really mean uh, objection or this could be a genuine objection that someone really wants to know. And the answer um, is first that God objects and opposes and condemns homosexuality because He loves marriage. And He designed marriage between a man and a woman in a lifelong covenant. 
And homosexuality distorts that and and is a a rebellion against what God designed in Genesis 2 and what Jesus affirms in Matthew 19. It distorts marriage and it distorts procreation. It hinders procreation, which is also something that God designed. But it also distorts the Gospel that God loves Ephesians 5 shows us God's heart toward the relationship of His Son toward a bride. His Son, Son, male, bride, female, language, picturing what? The Gospel. Homosexuality is an attack on the Gospel because it's an attack on marriage, and marriage is a picture of the Gospel. And that's our biggest concern as Christians about all of this. Our strongest argument against homosexuality is not just all the prohibition passages in the Bible. The Bible says don't do that. It's sin. That's not our biggest pushback. Our biggest pushback is this distorts the good news of the Gospel. This distorts marriage. It hinders procreation. These are beautiful things that God designed. I want to end with just one passage that applies to heterosexuals and homosexuals equally. Because we are all debtors to grace and all have one hope that is Christ. Listen to Paul in 1 Timothy 1.13. I'll let him have the last word. He says, I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And, gr- and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and and, and deserving of full acceptance that Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display His perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in Him for eternal life. To the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Father, we are debtors to grace. We know that we were born into this world with problems we could not fix, with tendencies, with temptations, with inclinations that are sinful. And only Your Son can cleanse us and change us. And so all glory to You, the immortal, invisible, only true God who gives mercy to sinners. Lord, we pray that would be the resounding message that would go forth from this church as we engage anyone and everyone, is that there is mercy and grace to be found in Your Son. We thank You for that. Lord, as we come to the table, we pray that we would very personally remember the work that You did for our sins. Especially our sexual sins. And we praise You, Jesus, that Your work was sufficient. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.